that leads on to the second lesson that I wanted to share, which is that we have to always stand ready to detect these early warnings and more importantly, respond to them. Mr. Magnus spoke about the ASEAN Declaration of Human Rights, which is really going to be a monumental document. It comes hot on the heels of the establishment of the commission which he sits on. It also comes hot on the heels of the establishment of the ASEAN Charter itself, which wasn't too long ago. This charter places at its center an importance and an emphasis on human rights, the rule of law, and good governance. These are not empty words. These are words which went through a great deal of debate. And you should ask Professor Ko about that as he was involved in the drafting of the charter and in the entire process that led to its establishment. And when we look at these principles which are now infused in the ASEAN Charter and that the ASEAN states are bound by agreement to respect, you start realizing that we need to do or have a sense of the things that could prevent genocide and other sorts of atrocity across the region. And that work, I would suggest, needs to be comparative. Meaning, if we are looking at ASEAN countries, we're not just looking at ASEAN countries as the 10 countries or extending to the 11th Southeast Asian country, my favorite, Timor-Leste. We are actually looking beyond. You're looking at contemporary conflicts around the world. For instance, what's happening in South Sudan as we speak in the Jongli region, where two ethnic groups, despite independence or perhaps because of it, are still engaged in ethnic conflict. What can we learn from that situation? More importantly, what could we offer? And in this sense, I would propose that this country in particular, and hopefully other countries in the region, which have enjoyed peace and security in the past decades, need to start thinking about their responsibility as well. Just as Germany has spent the past few decades investing in awareness of genocide prevention in its own country and beyond, and spent a great deal of resources engaged in helping other countries do their best, as have several other countries assembled here, I would say that Asian countries and ASEAN countries in question need to think about the best practices that they have put together. In this regard, I've got two suggestions. One is, let's engage with the people who have come from far away, who happen to be in Singapore and have a great deal of expertise. Those people who work with me, who are seated in the fifth row from the start, are looking very nervous because they think I'm going to mention them by name, which I shall. But I would like to mention one person in particular, and that is Ms. Bernadette Yodu. We have the privilege of having her work at the Singapore Management University with us here in Singapore, purely by chance. And that chance is that she married a good old Singaporean boy. And so we have the privilege of her being here. Bernadette and Joel, her husband, come to us from Uganda, particularly the refugee law project of the University of Makerere. The reason I mention this is, they are always quick to point out to me that when you think about genocide prevention, you're not just looking at a loaded word like genocide. You're looking at a much more simple and day-to-day -day issue, which is diversity management. I will not speak about this in depth because Mr. Zainal Abdin Rashid really is the expert as far as Singapore is concerned. But I would suggest that Singapore has some lessons to offer, at least the regional countries, on how we have tried to deal with diversity. Because we've had problems, as Mr. Magnus mentioned, in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s. But we've come a long way. We have some way to go, but we have come some way. What are these best practices? In doing so, Bernadette is doing research at the moment, comparing what's happening in certain African states with what's happening in the 10 ASEAN countries, seeing what we can learn both ways. That's the sort of work that we need to start doing, really. If we want to really get a grip on how we can never let the Holocaust happen again, that's what we've got to do. The second person that I would mention is not here, but is a good friend of Mr. Magnus and Professor Tommy Koh, who is a friend to Singapore and is going to be increasingly involved in Singapore 
both at the National University of Singapore and at the Singapore Management University. He's of Jewish descent, but is an American. His name is Professor David Cohen. And the reason I raise his name is Professor Cohen will soon be going into a research and academic partnership with both our universities here in Singapore, both our law schools, I should say. And why that is so monumental to me is that he's the director of the War Crime Study Center of the University of California, Berkeley. This is a center that has been devoted to genocide prevention study, research, training, and court monitoring for the past 15 years. And to have that sort of expertise now be based possibly in Singapore gives us that added edge, and I would say a responsibility to do something for the region. We need to tap on these resources, and equally important, we need to tap on the resources in this room of Singaporeans and people from Asia who want to do something for their own region. The final lesson that I would like to share to combat genocide is actually a much more simple one, something from the heart. And I won't speak too long because I have a very short two-minute clip for you all to see. And from my own experience and the experience of my wife, Vinita, when we began doing this sort of work, we would say that really to start understanding and stopping mass atrocity from, from happening, you've got to roll up your sleeves and you've got to actually speak to survivors of mass atrocity. The speakers earlier have spoken about survivors of the Holocaust, of Auschwitz, of, for example, eminent publicists like Mr. Eli Wiesel, Nobel laureate. There are certain people in the region who are far less eminent, but whom we could actually learn from. I will show you very shortly a clip of Mr. Chumai, who is a survivor of the S21 prison, one of five survivors who are still alive, unfortunately. 17,000 people were interned, 14,000 people were killed at this prison. And it's important for us to hear from him for one simple reason. What you'll hear from him is not what you would expect. Because what we would expect is that all survivors are appreciative and happy for justice, are happy for the law. That is only partly true. Because I would say that in any response to mass violence, the law can only offer that much.